That's how we interact with each other in language. But when you have a text like the Quran that is always read through the Sunnah of the Prophet, you have to look at what the Sunnah of the Prophet is telling you to understand the intended meaning of the text. And in that case, the intended meaning of God's words is not necessarily the one that's closest to the evident meaning. It is the one that is best supported by the evidence of the other verses of the Quran, of the Sunnah of the Prophet, of our, our understanding of the overall teachings of Islam. This is what tells us the intended meaning of the, of the Quran. And so when we read that verse that I mentioned, the verse 434, the quote, quote, wife beating verse. When you read that, you don't read it through what comes to your mind first. You read it what comes to your mind after you understand the Sunnah of the Prophet. And the Sunnah of the Prophet on this issue is very clear. What does Aisha say in Sahih Hadith? She says, the Prophet, ma darba ahadan qat. The Prophet never struck anybody biyadihi. Never struck anybody with his hand except not a man, not a woman, not a servant, except in the path of jihad. Never struck anybody. And when this uh, this uh, first this verse is revealed that I read to you about Adri Buhunna, the context in which it's revealed, according to Hadith and Sunan Tirmidhi and other books, is that the uh, a woman comes to the Prophet and complains about her husband striking her. And the Prophet says, La tadribu ima Allah. Do not strike the female servants of God. And then uh, uh, Omar comes to the Prophet, depending on the, ver the version of the Hadith, comes to the Prophet and says, You know, the, the women in Medina are not, uh, they're very, uh, they, they're kind of um, overcoming their husbands. You know, they're very like forceful in their personalities. They're not like the, the women in Mecca. And so then the, the then this verse is revealed and talks about how uh, that, you know, if your wife is having no shoes, first you admonish her. If she does not desist, then you uh, see sleeping with her. She still continues. Then the verse says you strike her. But what does the prophet say about that? He said, Ulaika laysa ulaika khayarakum. Those people who strike their wives are not the best of you. In another verse, version of the hadith in the Mustadrik of Al Hakam and Naisaburi, he says, lan The best of you will not strike your wives. And in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet says, والسلام, La yajlidu ahadukum uh, imra'at, uh, jald, jald abd, thumma yujami'uhu akhir al nahar, or akhir al, uh, al yom. Let one of you, let none of you strike his wife like he'd strike a slave and then go and sleep with her at the end of the day. And in his final sermon, his final khutbah at Hajj, what is one of the things the Prophet says? He says, Fear God as concerns your wives because you have taken them as a trust from God. They are, they are in your trust. And he says, only if they do commit what's called, what he says is fahisha mubayyina, an egregious egregious uh, you know, inappropriate behavior, egregious fahisha then strike them but what? Only strike them darb ghair mubarrih in a way that leaves no mark that causes no harm so that's the sunnah of the prophet that we have to, that, that through which we read this verse and through which Every Islamic school of thought would read this verse. Which is why in the various schools of law, and you now, I, I see a lot of you are students here, you know um, how complicated fiqh is. You know how many different opinions, like for example in the Hanafi Medhab you can have, you know, Zahir Riwayah, and you have the the opinion of Imam Abi, Abi, Abi Hanifa, the opinion of Abu Yusuf, the opinion of Muhammad bin Hassan Shibani, the opinion of Zufar bin Hudayl, of all these opinions. So fiqh is very complicated. But across the, the different madhabs, there's, a, there's the same theme over and over again. You can only strike your wife lightly in a way that causes no harm. If you cause her harm, you're liable for the dia, 
you're liable for compensating her for injuries. And according to um, every school except the Hanafi school, the, a judge, if a wife goes to a judge and says, my husband's beating me, and there's witnesses or evidence that the husband's beating her or the, the husband confesses, the judge can do what's called tafriq. He can end the marriage legally. And the wife will get to keep her mahr, and the husband has to pay her nafaka until her idda ends, and the marriage is over. And this is what I found very interesting in my research, that if you look at Sharia court information about Sharia courts, whether it's in you know Iran in the 900s or Andalusia in the 900s or Syria in the 1300s or you know Jenneh in Mali in the 1900s or Zanzibar in the 1900s or Yemen in the, the mid-20th century or Egypt in the 1920s, you always see the same thing. Husband or wife goes to the court, says, my husband's beating me. If there's evidence that he's beating her, like physically, if there's witnesses, if the husband confesses, judge would uh, do, uh, end the marriage. If the woman wants, he'll end the marriage. She keeps her dowry. She gets maintenance. And the husband, if there's injury, has to pay to compensate the injury. And this is, for example, in the Hanafi realm of uh, Palestine in the 17th century, there's one case where a woman has some of her teeth knocked out by her husband, and the judge says, you have to pay, husband, you have to pay your wife three gold coins because this is the dia for teeth. And so it's very interesting because in the, 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 the tradition of American law and British law, it's only in the very late 19th century in the, or in the 20th century that uh, a husband can ever have to pay any money to his wife. Before then, my husband, women aren't allowed to, married women aren't allowed to own property. And, they, and there's something called in law tort immunity, where the husband's actually immune from any case that his wife brings against him that he harmed her. It's impossible for him to be liable financially to her. But in the Islamic tradition, since the very beginning, since the life of the Prophet, part of the Sharia was that just because you're married to somebody doesn't mean that if you injure them, you don't have to pay for it. You can't be held accountable before the law. You're always held accountable. In the Sharia, in the Sharia, if you harm anybody, you're held accountable. Doesn't matter if they're your wife or your husband. It is reported that Ali radiallahu anhu has said, "Zawij ibnataka taqiya. In ahabbaha akramaha, wa in abghadaha lam yadlimha." Get your daughters married to those who are fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they love them, they will honor them. And if they dislike them, at least they won't oppress them. They'll send them home in one piece. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding that when a divorce occurs, don't become too bitter about it. It has happened. It's not the first divorce, nor is it the last divorce. Don't become too bitter. Understand, if that girl has come back home in one piece without being oppressed, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our daughter is back home. It might not be the ideal situation, but at least she was not beaten till her bones broke. And remember, wife bashing is haram. Here in these verses, the issue of the beating is mentioned in these verses, but the understanding is not my understanding, nor is it yours. The understanding of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. That does not mean right. The Quran has told me I'm allowed to bash a woman, bring my baseball back, let me better. No, that is absolutely haram. Do you know that a marriage can be nullified by the group of ulama if a husband has bashed his wife. If that was permissible, why then would it be allowed to nullify the marriage just through him having beaten her? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So those people who are going around saying the Quran allows a man to beat a woman, they don't know what they're talking about. The Quran says that when as a last resort a woman is not listening and she does not want to look at you when you are talking to her you may draw her attention by tapping her that is the term barb does not necessarily mean to go out and beat and thump and thud if that was the case we would have read so many ahadith of the sahaba having done that radiallahu anhum they didn't do that but when we read the ahadith they used a siwak do you know what is a siwak a small stick which is used to clean the teeth compared to the baseball bats that we are using today a small stick that is used to clean the teeth that was only used to draw the attention of the women. That was how they understood Wadribu Hunna.
That is how they understood it. So why should we then try and say, no, the Quran doesn't have that verse. When we go and speak to those modernists and those people who want to now delete verses of the Quran, don't deny it. Say, look, the understanding is the understanding of the Sahaba. And also over and above that, a woman who's been bashed, you have the right to apply to the ulama, to the bodies, to the ulama authorities in the Muslim countries, to the courts. And that marriage will be nullified on those grounds. If it was permissible, how could it have been nullified? So let's understand the Sharia. There's no loopholes in Islam. And there is nothing barbaric in this Sharia. That, that is the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.